All right, well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being persistent today. I know it was raining outside, but uh, it shows that you guys are really here to come and learn more about how you can have an impact. Uh, I'm Khalil, I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager, and uh, welcome to the panel today. It's going to be Frontiers of Social Innovation, and we have a lot of interesting panel members here going to talk to you about their experience. Uh, we're expecting one more uh, panel member who's, who's unfortunately a bit late, but he's going to be joining us throughout the discussion. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Julie. Uh, Julie is our uh, Social Innovation Coach and Fellow at District 3, so she helps entrepreneurs here who are looking to build a startup in social innovation, social entrepreneurship. She's been with us for over two years and a half and, and has over 25 years of experience working in that sector. And who here is coming to District 3 for the first time just by a show of hands? Okay, perfect. So for those of you that don't know, District 3 started about five years ago and our primary mission is really to help entrepreneurs who want to build and, and grow their startup. So we've helped about 480 startups in the past uh, five years, and they come from all sectors, including social innovation. And so for people that are interested in social innovation and entrepreneurship, we have specific programs and different coaches like Julie that are here to be able to help you. Um, so I hope you enjoy the panel. Uh, Julie is gonna be our moderator, and she's gonna introduce our speakers. And uh, so the, the agenda, we're gonna start off with the questions that we've prepared uh, for, for the panel members, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. All right, sounds good? Perfect. All right. Julie, it's all yours. Perfect. I'll use this for now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming in the uh, middle of July in this rain. Uh, wonderful to see all of you guys. Uh, just to correct a bit, uh, Khalil, I've been around D3 for almost four years now, so I'm one of the old ones. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'd like to introduce... Uh, our panel for the evening, like Alil said, we have some fixed questions. Uh, take some notes and then afterwards, uh, Q&A. And the Q&A we scheduled about half an hour, but it can go longer if you guys have so much more questions. So no problem. And there's after that, there's going to be some networking if you want. Uh, I'd like to present Danica Spray. She's the director of uh, Venture and Strategic Partnership at Ashoka Canada. Uh, Danica leads the search and selection of new Ashoka uh, fellows in Canada and supports them to thrive through the world's uh, leading network of social entrepreneurs. Uh, Danica will explain a bit later uh, what Ashoka Canada does. Uh, and also she's a co-founder of Street Suds, which is an uh, uh, assassin, I understand. Uh, so social enterprise. Uh, where they transition employment for uh, uh, for men and women who are homeless uh, in Montreal, I believe. Uh, next year, we have two co-founders, uh, Jean-Philippe Couture and Nathan Dabby. I said it properly. Uh, uh, co uh, they are co-founders of uh, Mamobile Clinic. Mobi Clinic, sorry, which uh, brings uh, mobile uh, uh, pediatric clinics to help alleviate uh, the transportation and the language barriers uh, for new immigrants and for uh, social economically uh, vulnerable segments of the population uh, uh, by leveraging you know the smart technology and also using AI I do believe uh, we'd like to congr congratulate them they just came back from Paris and they won uh, they won first prize ex with another team 
uh, the Tocqueville Challenge and, uh, in Paris, and they won 10,000 uh, euros uh, aimed to uh, the project, right? Cool. The other one that's missing, uh, I'll introduce now, and then you'll just fit in and as we're going to try to go, uh, is Marc-André Robert. Uh, Marc-André is the co-founder of an agricultural uh, tech startup, uh, building a management platform where the bees tell the beekeepers uh, what they need and when they need it uh, in order to raise healthy uh, beehives, basically. Uh, and it's a major issue with the dwindling uh, bee population and the bees uh, are extremely important in our ecosystem. They, they pollinate about 60% of all uh, our you know, environments, so it's very important. So when Marc-André comes in, uh, please say hi to him. Um, okay, so that's the presentation. So I'm going to set up basically social innovation. Uh, it's a big word, right? Yeah. Everybody's talking, and it's a happening word. Everybody's talking about social innovation, social economy. Uh, everything social is is hot. But it's been around in Quebec for over 50 years, uh, in case you haven't known. And social economy is uh, a legal entity here in Quebec where it's actually uh, thriving. Uh, they employ over 200,000 people uh, in different kinds of social uh, businesses. Um, so it's 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 a big business for us. Um, so solving the world's social issues uh, is a complex process, right? Uh, and there's systems involved. There's various variables. There's factors involving people, uh, uh, material uh, involving rules, and all of them are affecting each other. So social innovation. Uh, l looks at the triple bottom line instead of just looking into the economic aspect, just the business of it. It also includes society and it also includes the environment. So the three layers of running a business. And even the for-profit regular business, even the startups, they all have a social impact. It's just to educate them that they do have an impact and they can make a difference. Uh, that's my job trying to educate them. Uh, social entrepreneurs, uh, they address one piece of that big puzzle. Uh, they cannot solve every issue that's out there. They pick something that they like and they go for it. And they try to bring a solution or some solutions uh, into that uh, uh, entire puzzle. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to bring you to uh, Mamma B Clinic. Okay, so I'm gonna present. I yeah, here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask you questions for you guys. Okay, uh, so Jean Philippe Nathan, uh, your startup is focused uh, to overcome barriers of languages and transportation for new immigrants, like we mentioned, and uh, those who are vulnerable in segments that are uh, in difficult areas presently in Montreal, but it can be replicable elsewhere. Uh, can you explain uh, how your startup is achieving the goal of, remember, we're, we're solving one little issue of that big puzzle of social innovation. Can you explain to us uh, uh, what your startup is trying to achieve in having an impact in that? Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so what we want to achieve, actually, it's um, we believe that health, it starts with, like, it, uh, everything starts with health. So after that, your kids will uh, have a better education if they are healthy. And that's why we, we, we picked uh, health, and for children especially. So our goal is, uh, here there's a lot of people, we think often that, if you, you, you need to go to Africa or like maybe in poor countries uh, to see those type of things. But here in Montreal, you have the, these things. Uh, you can have families that don't, don't have access to healthcare, especially even if we have a lot of clinics or hospitals. But for them, sometimes they have a lot of kids. They don't really understand the system. It's really difficult. So we want to make sure for them to empower them and to give them a chance to understand the system 
and to go directly to them, so not them going to the hospital or to the clinics. We want for them that it's going to be a walking uh, distance and it's going to be cheaper and they don't have to uh, miss job and sometimes when they miss job uh, they lose wages for the day so it can make a difference in between paying a rent or not so th that's how we want to start actually and after that uh, of course maybe we want to scale up in the future and not only by the number of trucks and pediatric system but maybe by other type of services and it can be also uh, by other type of, uh, not even in health, but it can be other things also. So what's your role in the Murphy Clinic versus yeah. okay. Nathan? So uh, actually we're four, four person co-founders involved in the project. Uh, today we can only be two. Uh, he's Len, she's the pediatrician, she cannot be here to, uh, today. Uh, there's also Mustafa who cannot be here, he's living in Alberta, so it makes it a little bit uh, difficult. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's the engineer guy. I'm Jean-Philippe Couture, uh, doing the finance, and uh, Nathan Dabi doing the marketing and communication. Cool. Super. How about for you, Nathan? Why, why did you get involved in, in this project? Um, you hear me? You good? Uh, I, I don't like because we're recording. Okay, I will try. Um, at Mamou Clinic, we believe that access to health is fundamental right, human right. So um, when we ask that, we can just imagine perhaps the village from Africa or Asia that you have some kind of issues uh, access to. We can imagine perhaps children malnourished or don't access to doctors or clinics. And what if I said to you that you have kind of issues in Montreal? Just go to Oshlaga, just the other side of the town already. And there is no pediatric clinics. No, no clinics, no emergency for kids. So uh, our, uh, our main in innovation is get this kind of uh, solution and innovation for this kind of issue. In Montreal, I mean, it's a big city, in big, in big country. We have this, and it's not. We cannot just say uh, it's kind of. Uh, we have to wait for uh, government to have solution. We can ha have have our part of this solution. So we are. Let's. Add something, okay. Uh, so we start, but, but with, with Rizan, because we, we have story uh, with, with Mamoui Clinic. Uh, Rizan is a, mission, is a doctor in uh, Saint Justine. So she started that there, there is some lack of system, uh, the health system in Canada. And uh, we start to talk about it. And we start with, Fidi, with John Fidi and Mustafa. Why we don't propose something that is innovative, ask government to help us, and ask also. Uh, uh, community centers to help us ask uh, partners from private to help us and get a solution that co-create this uh, kind of solution. And just if I can add something, uh, we plan to be to first start in the southwest borough of Montreal, and as you know, there's getting there's a lot of gentrification, so there's less less services for vulnerable vulnerable families. So Mama Clinic, the aim is to reach these families. Uh, with this. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bonsoir, Marc André and Marc André Roberge. Uh, we have introduced uh, what Nectar does. We'll let you uh, come in. There's water behind you for you. Uh, take a breather and I'll introduce uh, Danica and uh, what she does. Okay. And then we'll go with you. Cool. How about you, Danica? Uh, Ashoka. <laughs> Ashoka is a, a global uh, network, right, uh, of more th of 3,500 social uh, entrepreneurs around the world, uh, and which always had uh, linked the notion of social entrepreneurship and system change. Uh, so can you tell us uh, about your role and what Ashoka does in Canada and where you want to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, just maybe to get, to, I'm also very curious about the crowd and you know who who here is talking about social innovation for the first time. Just raise a hand. 
Yep, okay, awesome. And social enterprise, anybody uh, talking about this for the first time or? Yeah, okay, awesome. And does anybody work in this space currently? Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Just curious to know sort of like familiarity. Um, so Ashoka, um, I think it's helpful just to give a little bit yes. of context because yeah. I think that Ashoka is like one of those organizations that it could be a black box if you go on the website. It's so confusing because it's, it's a network and there, we, we are sector agnostic. We work in lots of different spaces. So um, the reason Ashoka started 35 years ago was because uh, we realized that there was a need to focus on this certain type of person, which we called a social entrepreneur. Um, this was in real like peak international development years when our notion of development was let's send somebody from an expert from a developed country to a developing country. Um, let's tie the aid to the developed country. Um, let's fund organizations um, to address other people's problems. So while it might have been, I mean, this is a whole debate, whether it was, it was well-intentioned or not, um, but what often was happening was that the problems were being misdiagnosed. Because you had, you might have had an expert from one context, but they go to another context and then they, they don't understand fully the whole problem. And so therefore the solution is, is often missing the mark. And so, uh, so Ashoka, what we wanted to do was um, identify the people that were closest to the problem so that we could, and not only just closest to the problem, but I mean by that, to like experience the problem that they were trying to solve, but also had an innovative solution that could actually tackle that problem head on and the, and the reason why that problem exists in the first place. And so we started with this thing called the Ashoka Fellowship, which was investing in people, not in the organization. So that's a, a very different piece to Ashoka that you will find elsewhere in the world. Um, I'm not saying that's the best, there, uh, you, you need to have the diversity, but that's specifically what we do, is we invest in people. So we look for the social entrepreneurs that are closest to the problem with the, those innovations, and then we get behind them to support them um, to develop those innovations for systems change. And that's through you know, a modest stipend, but also the partners um, and the mentors and the network, the global network, to coach them and bring that, that to scale. And so when we think of like the ecosystem approach to social change, um, where Ashoka sort of would identify themselves is looking for social entrepreneurs with ideas that have the potential for systems change. So what does that mean? That means that the idea is addressing the root cause of that problem. So one example, I used to work, my background is in um, water and sanitation. So one example is eco-sanitation. Who here is familiar with eco-sanitation? Anyone? Okay, so, e so if you think about our traditional, and get ready, we're gonna be talking about poop. Um, <laughs> if you think about our traditional uh, you know, sanitation system, it's uh, you know, humans excrete waste, it's waste. It, we flush it away, we use water, a precious resource, to flush it away, it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's gone. Eco-sanitation is considered a social innovation because it basically flips the whole notion of sanitation on its head and create and in a system changing way. So what that means is, so eco-sanitation doesn't consider waste, human ex ex excrement as waste, it sees it as a valuable resource. In human waste, there's there are rich um, nutrients like um, phosphates and nitrates and, and all sorts of things that we can use for fertilizers. We can also make biogas out of it. You know, and there's lots that you can do out of that waste. And so the model, what it does is instead of flushing it with water, which is also a precious resource that we're using to get rid of stuff, we um, design a toilet, an eco-sanitation toilet, which actually harnesses and captures the waste so that it can be used elsewhere. And so why that's innovative and socially innovative is because if you think of a context where there's not a lot of water resources and there's not even the infrastructure for um, piping and, and, and energy to, to make those sanitation systems flow, you put in a, an eco-sanitation solution and all of a sudden now, you're, you don't have the 
health problems associated with sanitation because you don't have the water to flush it away, you now have created uh, an income source, opportunities for um, social entrepreneurs to set up their own businesses, and then create spin-off businesses. So you could have somebody running the toilets, somebody capturing the nutrients, someone then selling the fertilizer to new farms. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a systems changing innovation because it's literally taken the old sanitation system and said, we're not like, it, this is creating a problem in under resourced areas, so we're gonna now create a solution, an innovative solution that creates social value. It's a long winded way to give one example of the types of entrepreneurs that we work with. So we look for those new ideas, we say, okay, is this having some impact? And then when we come in, we help to those entrepreneurs to think of uh, a strategy for systems change. Because often you'll have like an eco sanitation toilet, but they're still working in a traditional sanitation environment. So we might have to help them, uh, you know, broker the partnerships or whatever it might be, or, or even identify the partners um, to then scale that up. Cool. Thank you. Cool. We'll do questions later, so take some notes, guys. Uh, also, just a note, uh, this is being recorded, and it's going to be up on our social uh, network, so I guess Facebook and Twitter, wherever uh, our social thing is. Uh, I'm not that techy, as you can see. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be up and uh, uploaded tomorrow. So you were asking, so the whole thing is recorded. Uh, Martin Lee, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate more on, on Nectar's mission and uh, and what you're doing in impacting the big picture of social innovation with Nectar? Yeah. So you have the mission and what sure. you're doing? Sure. Let's start with the mission. So at Nectar, we help beekeepers understand what's going on inside their beehives. So we're building a translator of, of, of for, for honeybees uh, food technology. And the goal is to help them uh, bring up the uh, survival rate of honeybees, as well as providing, um, as well as providing growers that depend on honeybee pollination key metrics to understand how the pollinators will influence their, their yield. Um, the way it works is that we're providing a technological infrastructure that uses sensors within the hive that gathers information, so temperature, humidity, sound frequencies, the weight of the hive, and then we're able to diagnose remotely the hive's health and behavior, and then give insights on the beekeepers on how, like, for example, like what type of actions they should, be, they should be taking to to keep the bees alive. And on the other side, if you're a grower and you're, for example, a blueberry producer in Quebec and you fully depend on the honeybees to get a yield out of your blueberries, uh, we can provide them with key metrics on how the bees in real time will affect uh, the yield of the grower. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to go to regular questions, and we already sent the panel so that they could get ready. And it's all about existential questions about social entrepreneurship. <laughs> that I get people all the time asking me when they see me, it's like, well, what the heck is social entrepreneurship? And there's different, there's tons of definitions out there. Uh, so uh, let's start with you, uh, Marc Sure. Uh, how do you define social uh, entrepreneurship? And everybody get in on this. We're not going to ask if you have something to say or not to say. Just no problem. Uh, I think the way it's defined is, you know, as long as you bring positive value on a social or or environmental subject, basically like impacting positively the, the, those types of areas. That being said. Took me a long time to understand that what we were doing with social entrepreneurship, for example. Since you know, I'm a beekeeper in the past, or kind of part-time beekeeper, so I started this because I, you know, I saw that there was a need. At some point, it, you know, other people from kind of external to the company identified us as, you know, you guys are doing social entrepreneurship, but in the beginning, we're just solving a problem, and then we wanted to bring positive impact on our environment. So I think the, you know, that's how I would describe the. Uh, this social projects or entrepreneurship. Cool. Any of you guys uh, would like to have something? Yeah, so I would, I would agree. Um, I, I work with a lot of universities to help them develop their social innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, and the semantics around this stuff is like binding. And so I, I always try to be careful with definitions because um, 
people can trip up. So now, now I like to try to take the most broadest approach, which is with social um, entrepreneurship, I just consider it being taking an entrepreneurial mindset to a social problem that includes the um, cooperative economy, that includes the for-profit economy, that includes the nonprofit um, sectors. Like there, there's a there's a there's an approach and a mindset to it, and it's creating social value and it's putting social value first. Actually, I should also highlight that social value first, and then you layer in. The, the business um, or the other partners to help make it financially sustainable. That, that was pretty complicated. That was pretty <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Nathan? Uh, did, did you want to add something to it? Uh, I would just uh, add something about our, our experience at Mobile Clinic because we start our, we are a startup, yeah. Uh, and we start with social uh, fields, so we know us that we are acting in social field, but we didn't know that we are entrepreneurship. So we start with uh, social, and um, we develop a new kind of services and uh, adding AI and innovative mobile uh, uh, innovation solution for these kind of people. Uh, so they said us. You are a uh, social, uh, social entrepreneurship. Sorry, I'm a French guy, so my English is very bad. Um, and kind of uh, words still in my mind, French. <laughs> uh, so we start, ah, yeah, we are, uh, so on a, des entrepreneurs sociaux, social entrepreneurship. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, because we are working with a uh, partner with pri private and we are develop developing a new kind uh, of services and uh, the thing, uh, the main thing that we are starting to do is change, ch changing mindset uh, because in the social uh, services, we are, it's not from top to bottom, it's, it's co-creation with bottom and top and, and, and that's it. Thank you. Um, Leading to what Danica was talking about, that leads me to the, the next questions we have. Uh, there is a misconception regarding um, <laughs> building a business that is social. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people think that being a social entrepreneur, you need to be a non-profit organization. Uh, and that's not true. Uh, so I'd like to know, is Mabi Clinic going to be for-profit? You haven't decided yet. Yeah. As for now, yeah, it's, it's non-profit. It's going to be a non-profit? Since, since it's in the health system, it's a little bit easier also. And it's for vulnerable families, so it makes sense that it's non-profit. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And how about you? Uh, uh, I'm curious to, to, know, to know why you think that a non-profit uh, makes sense in the sense that, you know, since it's targeting vulnerable families, why it should be non-profit? Uh, because uh, the, the first picture they will have is looking, are you making profit? Because they, they will be scared a little bit. They're like, they don't, sometimes they don't really trust the system. So if they see that we are making profit, I don't, I don't say that it doesn't, uh, the two combined can ça peut pas aller ensemble. I'm not saying that. Because you can have in your value chain uh, social impacts. And there's hybrid uh, model right now of businesses doing profits and having social impact. Yeah, yeah. But for us, our model, I think since uh, sometimes they don't trust the system, we want to start with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's a non-profit. Uh, it's not that mean uh, we, we don't make money. We yeah. make money, but it's, or it's still non-profit and it's still business. Yeah. But it's for, uh, and we have um, in health system uh, care in Canada. It's for free, these kind of services. So we have to see for free uh, for uh, charge uh, of uh, beneficiaries. I'm assuming you are a for profit? We are a for profit. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you have a social mission. Yeah, I mean, our, our thinking behind that is that you need a powerful economic, economic engine to be able to promote your impact and mission. So in our case, if we want to have a, an impact on the global food supply, we need to have something behind it that makes it happen. Um, so, so yeah, so we decided to be a non-profit in the beginning because we knew that at some point, like we need, like we would need to raise money, 
because we're a hardware software AI company, so there's a lot of moving parts that need to be funded, and initially, uh, so we need infrastructure to be able to do that. So, so yeah, so that's how we, we decided to uh, to start a company, and so far, you know, it's it's proven to be so far it's proven to be right in, in our context. So I understand that not in every context it does make sense, but in our context it does. Okay, that works. Yeah, Danica, do you have any examples? Of yeah, sure. So, um, uh, so it, with our, our network, it runs as a as a charity. But within our network, we have programs. And depending on who the program is and who's paying for the program, we'll have different price points. So we have programs for universities; they pay us, and it's a revenue generating program. Um, some of the network entrepreneurs in our network, they are for profit because even if they're beneficiaries, so for example, one woman we work with is um, uh, Métis, and she works across the, the Northwest Territories, the Yukon and none of it. Her beneficiaries are young indigenous um, girls, but the people who pay for her program is the, are the territory governments. And so they're paying her at, pro at profit um, but her beneficiaries are, are the young women, and it's because she's delivering a better service than the competitors. So there's so many ways you can slice and dice it. It's just a question of who's going to pay for your service and how are you going to make it um, sustainable. One of the things, the, the, the big difference with being a for-profit, non-profit, or a co-op uh, is the funding, the availability of funding and the different ways you can go. Uh, so for profit is more of the traditional uh, methods of going find either some VCs, uh, bank, traditional banks. Uh, uh, how did you uh, crowdfunding? You did crowdfunding, right? No. 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 Uh, no, we did uh, everything we could. Okay. <laughs> you know, so, so we got a bit, a little bit of VC. We uh, got some loans. We got some, yeah. So yeah, VC loan grants, uh, what think, like whatever you can get your hands on in the beginning is really helpful. Uh, so we're, we're we're raising right now and uh, it's going well. So it's going to be a mix of uh, private investors with uh, like a little bit of public funding mm -hmm. since there's vested interest that we exist in, like within the agriculture industry. Did you have to give up some equity on uh, yeah. the business? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yes, like you. Yeah. Do you lose control? Like I would say, like it depends who you're partnering with. And we, we really look at that carefully, like who we partner with. And they, like, they need to be people that, that understand what we're doing and that really understand the mission first. And then they see the opportunity that, that that's behind it. Um, so that's our way to approach private financing. Um, so so far, like every member that we've brought on board, you know, whether it's in investors or people within the team that have part of the, of the company has, has been able to provide value to the company and to the mission. Right. And it's the mission that that's what decide, the, defines you as a social entrepreneur. It's, it's the mission again that comes first. Yeah. Even though he's for profit. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. in, our, in our case, the mission is a company. And yeah. like, if there's no mission, the network doesn't really exist. Exactly. And you know, that's what really. Uh, yeah. For the non profit, the, 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 you can go another way. Uh, you don't have equity, okay? And the governance is very different uh, because you have a board of directors uh, and. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys talk, uh, um, and the financing is different. You're gonna go for grants. Uh, there's uh, foundations that are gonna help you. Uh, how else? Uh, winning contests, yes. challenges, right? Uh, how are you gonna finance the project? So for us, actually, we are partnering with uh, the Children's Hospital right now, and uh, we are looking for opportunities with the foundation. So we we are in neg negotiation with them. So that they plan to uh, finance the launch and even the exploitation for every year. But it's really about foundations and private investors. What makes uh, what we made what we made it different uh, for uh, for Mamabui Clinic is we 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 can start for uh, for non profit and every we reach to have money for our um, uh, for export. Um, for our needs, operations. the operation costs are uh, for it should be very hard to reach it for every. What we start at the beginning, we said we have to find someone to uh, to as partner for not one year, for five or ten years. 
So we took time before, um, we, because we didn't uh, in our uh, mindset to have uh, charity uh, donation every year. We want someone to, because uh, our social mission is very important for us, it's very important for our beneficiaries. We didn't, we don't want, uh, didn't want to start services or mission and, and die, after die after one year or two years. So uh, one of big issue for us is to convince a main partner to stay with us for five or ten years, um, and I think we have uh, we, we just show one of the big foundation in, uh, in in Quebec with the Montreal Hospital. Yes. One thing you need to realize: being a nonprofit, you're still running a business, so you have to at, at the end aim to be viable and to be uh, sustainable, it's very important. So I'm glad that they looked at the long-term uh, aspect because it takes a long term bef uh, before you can actually generate enough revenue to cover all your operations. And when you're a nonprofit, it's not called, uh, it's, the, the extra money is not called profits, they call surpluses. And then it's the board of director through the uh, General Assembly that decides how they're gonna reinvest uh, the extra money of the operation, it either in more services, uh, yeah, better salaries for the employees, uh, equipment, whatever. Or other associations or other uh, non profit or research yes. and development. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you still have to run a business, and that's the thing when you say, oh, yeah, a social, a social entrepreneur, you know, they depend on the government and our, our, on our, my, my taxes. Not true. They have to run it as a business. You have responsibility. You have respons responsibility yes. for for that, for wages, for services, yes. for running, and to be responsible of your managing your structure. Yeah, and the board of directors is sure. there for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask you. Uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, the next step. Uh, what do you, what are the challenges you consider to be unique uh, in being a social startup? What's what's unique for you and the biggest challenge you've met and you've been a so you're a social entrepreneur with SEDS mm -hmm. well I actually I, I'm I kind of want to speak to the last question I think oh sure to, sure because I I would have loved this information when I was first starting my, <laughs> my social enterprise but um so before Ashoka, I used, I, used, I used to work for a drop-in center downtown it still exists it's called the St. James drop-in center it's for um men and women living on the street, um, struggling with homelessness, and there was a creative arts center there. Um, I ran the creative arts center, and what it did was it served as a um, revenue generator for the art for the artists. So what we would do is have these vernissages, and then the sales would go half to the center, half to the artists. What we found was that the folks in the center that weren't artists didn't have any opportunity to, to get money. And so what we want to do is create a transitional employment program that could serve um, uh, the, the rest of the, the folks in the center. So Street Suds is a laundry service that runs as a transitional employment program. So there are social workers there that work with um, individuals. They might have addictions problems or they're struggling with addictions, um, um, challenges with mental health. Um, but typically they are off the street at this point, they're plugged into the welfare system, and now the, we're trying to help them get into more mainstream employment opportunities. So when we started, we were out of the St. James Drop-In Center, and I was, you know, like 21, rent, like, developing this idea. So we had this business plan, and we were going around to the SEDEX, the... Yeah, uh, corporation. Community Corporation Economic Development. They don't yeah. exist anymore now. It's PME Montreal that replaced them. Mm -hmm. So we were so sort of like this entity at the municipal level where we were taking a business plan, trying to get them to invest in it, and it was like crazy. They, you know, I'd be in tears like, why don't you want to fund this? And they, it, it was like, there's no way. This is insane. Uh, this is so high risk. And so it took. A, we tried, you know, competitions. We tried all sorts of things. It wasn't until I, I, um, I did my undergrad at McGill, so I went to the McGill 
um, business competition there. And then we won that, and it was only $5,000, but it was after a year of fundraising. That sort of stamp of approval, which I'm sure you guys are gonna get, and I'm sure you probably had that in your history as well, is somebody just sort of giving you a stamp. All of a sudden, we were you know, in the newspapers, and we were in the press, and then we had all these different people knocking on our doors. So it, it, it took like quite a bit of time to figure out who, um, who was gonna back this thing, and even though it was only $5,000, it basically opened up um, a bunch of film, basically grant money from um, the province of Quebec, as well as the, the feds, to support this launch. And then later, a year after that, we were able to partner with Empoa Quebec, and we said, if you can, um, if you can uh, still pay your, uh, $500 a month or whatever you might be paying to our employees uh, for their welfare, can you t like add on another whatever it is that we want to fully pay them for their salary for being in this program? Um, and what we'll give back to you is potentially a return of not having to pay their welfare in the future. But we, you know, we still were trying to work out that deal. And then we covered the rest of the cost, so that covered our employees' costs, but then we covered the rest of the cost with the, the contracts you're getting from running the, the laundry service. So that would be from hotels or restaurants. So it took, I just feel like understanding a little bit more about like the, the um, sequence of events of like what triggered the money um, is helpful. So it's a, an award, then philanthropic money, and then partnering with people who are already uh, an institution like Encore Quebec, who's already going to be paying those salaries, and basically saying, here's a better value um, for for your program. Yeah, um, I think when you were a finalist of Nova uh, last year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you win? Or? No, we 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 did not. <coughs> okay. It's okay. There were uh, ten great companies. So. <laughs> okay. But again, they did competition to get visibility, not just visibility oh, yeah. and money, but it, was it Maybe, more for the visibility for you? I mean, money is always great, uh, yeah. but visibility is, is also pretty key and right. you know, if, if you're doing fundraising or trying to get something out there, whether it's your product or, or, or message, you know, getting as much exposure as possible is really key to, to doing that. So. You know, if the media wants to see, like, ask you to go on radio or TV or in the, the paper, like you say yes because you don't know if that's going to happen another time. And then if you say yes once, then it's a you know, kind of good foot in the door to get more, more and more afterwards. Um, yeah. They've done reportage uh, on you, right? Yeah, they, this week is crazy. Seen, it's yeah. like one did uh, so Journal de Montréal and Journal de Québec did uh, an article on us, but they interviewed us like three months ago, and right. they just got it out this Monday, and now we're. We did CBC yesterday, we're doing CTV tomorrow, and yeah. Saving bees. Saving bees with AI. Yeah, I don't yeah that, that's great. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's get back to yes. challenge. Uh, as, a, as a social startup, what's a unique challenge you faced? Besides the money. Well, yeah, no, yeah. But addressing fundraising, uh, since you know that's what I've been yeah. doing in the past months, and there's a different approach to financing a social driven startup even though it's uh, for profit since you know our criteria number one is like do you understand the mission and if you're coming on board it's because of the mission right so usually you approach an investor as you know we have this great opportunity you're going to make tons of money on that um in our in our case it's more like this is a great opportunity but it's to save the bees and secure our food supply and then you're like you might be able to make some money on that uh, but approaching investors is really different in that case, so they un need to under understand that first. And on the other side, you know, the, the, having the tag social entrepreneur isn't always easy because some people see you as a nonprofit or like your goal isn't to make money. Well, it's it's just it's basically adding more difficulty. Like not like not, not only do you need to make money, but you need to answer to your mission as well. So it's kind of twice as hard. That's true. Uh, okay. Um, so I guess some of the challenges is, 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 is building off of what you said about the tag of social entrepreneur. It's valuable in some audiences and not in others. And so knowing your audience when you're, when you're making your pitch or, or communicating your idea is, is really important. So what, what I failed at with Street Sets was I went so hard first in every audience that 
all the business people are kind of like, oh God, let's like, stay away from that girl. Um, and so, because I don't think they thought I was going to take a rational approach to running running the, the enterprise. Um, and so, so even, you know, so when you're talking to Uncle Quebec, you're talking about the impact that, that Street Sucks is going to have on um, vulnerable and underemployed people in the in the in the city. When you're designing your website, Street Sets is a professional laundry service. That's what it is. And then you dig a little deeper. Oh wow, it has a social impact too. That's great. But I don't care because I'm a restaurant and I just want to freaking like have great laundry that's going to come back the next day. And so, just figuring out um, that sometimes you know the people paying for your service might not value the social mission as much as you do. And and as much as we want to get there, that you don't try to like b break your head over that at, at the outset. Just figure out how you can pull them in to support your cause. And I think what's really unique also is when we talk about we talk about profits and investors they're looking for quantitative impacts. But usually it's more of qualitative also impacts. And this is not easy to see with the eye. So that's what maybe social entrepreneurship is doing also. Can I uh, rebound on that? That being said, there's been a lot of work from the kind of social investor side of things to put metrics on it, to yes. be able to quantify yeah. you know, what's not quantifiable right now because like, for example, like SVX with Mars, they're a big yes. social uh, social investment platform. We're on it, and we work with the team on defining KPIs on our side because, like, we kept saying, like, we're going to save the bees, and this is we're going to secure food supply. But for real, like, if, if you help a beekeeping kind of your average beekeeping operation, like, what change is it going to to to, to bring to the industry? So they're working hard on being able to rationalize and build metrics built on measuring the impact, and not only on the financial side. I'll just add to that, unless you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. um, so, working for a network of entrepreneurs, like you get every freaking opinion out there in terms of um, impact um, metrics. You know, some people are very against it and they think it takes away from the richness of the work. And um, some of those people are some of the most powerful social entrepreneurs in this country. Um, and so, good, good on them. They're really good at engaging culture and storytelling and telling and compelling people to engage in their mission in a very different way. Others need those hard metrics to get in the door. Um, and so, one book for, for the, uh, that other sort of group of people, um, one book that I really like is called The End of Fundraising by Jason Saul, if you're interested. Um, he talks about the impact marketplace and how you, how you sell um, impact to um, people, you know, the, those partners that would otherwise totally um, walk past it. So one example is, you know, we're working with a big bank in Canada right now because they're concerned about the future of their employees. They want the, their future employees to have what we call change maker skills. So that's teamwork, collaborative entrepreneurship, um, on, uh, collaborative leadership styles, creativity. These are things that many of our higher education institutions are, are crushing right now. And so our programming actually works to bring out those um, they're called 21st century skills. We call them in our network change maker skills. Whatever you want to call them, it's 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 these yeah, soft so. skills around uh, you know basically working together effectively and in an innovative and entrepreneurial way, and that's what employers want. So this bank, so this is the impact outcome that we are selling to them, and then they're buying it, right? And so that's how we communicate like the given the, the transaction between us, even though. You know, when we're actually doing the work, that's totally off the table. So, if I just I would suggest that book because I found it really helpful for different communicating your work to different audiences. We we're talking about unique challenges of being a social, yeah. and especially your nonprofit, so that's mm, a bit different. For Momo Be Clinic, we have uh, three uh, unique challenges is we are a public services kind of work. Because um, when we did within the competition, it's very exposure and it's very benefits for our for, for starting for start visibility for for everything after. But they ask us, um, uh, you are providing services, but it's public services. Why? 
So we said that um, time to time innovation it's come from uh, for public, uh, it's for, from private, from society, from c civil like, like us, like students society. or yeah society, uh, and it's one of main uh, unique challenge. And second one, uh, how we will make it uh, sustainable and it's for free. And the third one. Yes, okay, you are uh, starting innovation from uh, partners with private, you and others. Okay, uh, second one, you are set for free that you have sustainable uh, business model, that's okay. But that exists, it's hospital or private clinics. What the third one, it's innovative one. We are starting with AI and innovative mobile uh, appointments and we are providing even for um, low income families and in neighbors, it's not the rich neighbor, uh, biggest services like we can find in other places like uh, private clinics. It's an empowering, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's about empowering uh, actually the, the society about their health and how they can, how they can help. And we're going to move on to the next question. There's only a few questions left, and then uh, we can add the Q&A, uh, which I'm sure you're looking forward to. Uh, in the past so many years that I've been uh, working in social economy, the successful social businesses, uh, the, 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 they always have a leader. There's someone that drives the place. Uh, so successful entrepreneurs, are able to lead and inspire uh, uh, their teams and their uh, on their journey. Uh, uh, so, how do you inspire others to help you on your journey? Your 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 start your pre startup right? Yeah, you're they're still working on uh, doing their interviews and all that through which service. But what inspires for people to get on board with your idea? Uh, what inspired people uh, to get? Involve and follow you is in your crazy dream of hey, I'm gonna get homeless people, but I have to show I have a business front of it. And bees, that's another one. So uh, I'd like to have your opinion. Uh, how did you manage to inspire people to get involved with your idea? So uh, yeah, just a couple of months ago, actually, we finished an MBA at HEC, and the project started there. And at first, we we did the project with one physician at the. Uh, children hospital and he was a little bit skeptic because he was like oh okay this is more of an MBA a project and after the MBA it, it will fail but uh, we continue to have a lot of quick wins like we won the Tugville challenge and we did uh, a lot of partnerships and a lot of contacts with a lot of people within a small amount of time so I think after that he was really impressed and after that he got really on board and he was even pushing uh, the upper management up there to to to, uh, to see us for the foundation and stuff. So it's really by uh, walk the talk. If you say something, just put it in actions, and people will will believe in you. Uh, yeah, I agree. Walk the talk. Uh, so I think also preview like before that you, there's a lot of education to, to, to do around your, your subject. Like for example, in our case, bees, people are kind of naturally drawn to the subject, but once they approach it, how do you make it approachable for to inspire other people? Right. So we, we did a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, making it more accessible for people to understand what type of impact uh, we could be generating through our technology. And then, like you said earlier, how do you how, how do you build this message depending on your target audience? Like if you want to bring in people within the team as employees or as co-founders in the beginning, like how do I make this an opportunity for them uh, to have an impact on, on the environment? If I want to bring clients, you know, like they're usually more skeptic in the beginning. Um, you know, how do I make this approachable for them as well? Like we're talking about tech and agriculture. Often it's not that well understood on their side. So you know, I, it's my job. It's my duty to make it accessible for them. Hmm. Um, I don't think I have the answer to this because I feel uh, I feel like I'm, I'm learning this all the time. Um, you know, when when it was, with Street Sense, it was it was I think they were excited that like a, a 
young kid was doing this program and so people wanted to get behind it. Um, now that I'm not a young kid anymore, I have to, it's a different approach when I'm working with, with people. So for instance, um, you know, like I said, I work a lot with universities and colleges and specifically to help them create um, a more robust social innovation um, and what we call change-making ecosystem on campus. So my way of getting these people is not by being some charismatic leader. It doesn't work at all. I have to basically meet them on their level with complete humility and basically say, what's your pain point? What's going on here? How can we help you? This is what we kind of know about this. This is what we don't know. And basically be an on the ground, um, trustworthy, transparent, and vulnerable partner. And that has been vulnerability and humility and transparency have been the biggest learners for me in this in this space working in um, in higher ed where people are very skeptical they don't have a lot of time they want your help but only if you can like really show them that you're a team player so it depends on what you're it depends I think on, on the kind of work that you're doing where you sit in the space if people want to believe in you or not or if they need you as a partner um, one thing I can say though about the Ashoka network is that because my job is to select new social entrepreneurs into our network. One question that I ask them is what is your leadership style? How do you, do you empower others in your approach and how do you empower others? And so this question is, you know, are you the hero at the front of the room that everybody's looking up to? Because that's probably gonna crumble within, you know, a couple of years when, when you get old <laughs> or when you aren't, you know, you mess up when yeah. people don't want to support you or you, yeah. you know, there's all sorts of reasons why you might crumble. And so the most robust and effective leaders are the ones that get, allow their teams to have agency, have creative agency to lead change as well. Um, and so there needs to be some, some faith when you're building teams, I think, for the kind of work Keep the microphone because this is a great lead in to our next question is that for individuals, they want to get involved, uh, they want to participate into uh, to become a change maker or uh, to try to solve a problem. Uh, what are the steps that gets them involved in this? Um, I think curiosity, so just follow, follow your curiosity. Um, I think um, I mean, I, that's the advice I always give to, to students that I work with is, is they're always like, what should I do? How should I get into this, this space? And it's like, if you look at my career path, it's like, it's all over the place. Like yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm so happy with where I've landed. And it's not that it's been easy, you know, like living in Germany off 200 euros a month was not easy. Um, you know, all these different sort of weird contracts I took. But um, I, I think that if you follow your curiosity, you'll ultimately land on what you're passionate about and what you're, and then you'll start to discover what you're good at in that space about what you're passionate about. Um, and then you'll, you'll go from there. Um, there's so much, you know, if you don't believe me, there's so much li um, literature and peer reviewed studies about the connection between um, passion and purpose and resilience. And so your ability to thrive later in life, in your personal life, in your professional life, in your family life. And so um, you can, Stanford just published a bunch of work on that. But there is, you know, I think w when you follow more of a, I think there's a lot of pressure to have like a purpose. And I think if you just follow your curiosity, you'll ultimately land there. Okay, cool. But just, just being here, it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, we're, we're coming to uh, the last two questions. Uh, I think it doesn't fit you guys because you're still brand new, you're still plugging away. Uh, uh, what are some of the strategies, especially for you, uh, uh, Marc-André, uh, that you've taken uh, to scale up your social impact? Uh, how many years have you been working on your project now? Personally, I've been working on this for three years. Right. Officially, two years. Um, scaling social impact. It kind of ties back to your answer in terms of curiosity and keeping that mindset throughout the journey. Um, for example, in our case, it started as a personal itch 
uh, you know, I have issues with my bees, I need to find something to help me understand what's going on because they're going to die if I, if I don't. Um, and then building from that, keeping the open mind of, you know, I'm going to discover stuff along the way. Um, for So coming from my own itch and now working with the kind of food providing industry, it's kind of a bridge in between of, you know, again, that kind of the zigzagging in between different hypotheses that you put up there, you see if it sticks, if it doesn't, then you change your hypothesis. So in our case, it went from kind of hobbyist beekeeping to how can we help commercial beekeepers produce kind of save more bees to produce more honey, and then we saw that the pollination industry was actually bigger than the honey one. So it led us to what we're doing now, but you know, it, our open mind enabled us to do that. And, so, and you know, keep asking questions, keep looking at different angles of the problems and everything. I would just say like, that to one sort of catchphrase you're, you'll probably hear a lot right now is like fall in love with the problem, yeah. not in love with the solution. Yeah. So that sort of mindset yeah, yeah. of like yeah. the problem of your, your bees allowed you to work through probably 25 prop like solutions that would never have worked yeah. at a faster pace. And if not, like you're going to come up with a Google Glass or a Segway, you know, it's something that is cool on paper and it looks nice, but you know, it doesn't really apply to any problem that you have currently. So in our case, it's really about, you know, focusing on the solution, uh, on the problem, and then you build something around it. You know, we use sensor now. If we don't have to use sensor in five years, like we don't really care. Right. Uh, and in being as a, a, an early startup, have you looked at the, how we're going to scale? Have you asked your question of how we're going to scale this? Or you're still in that mode where we're prototyping, we're going to try it in the Swiss, and, and then see from there? Yeah. Of course, we want to, to scale it, but uh, in the near future, it's more about Montreal. But later on, uh, maybe outside Montreal, in your uh, outside urban settings. So there's a lot of needs there. But um, actually, our, our solution uh, it's nothing new. It's something from the States. Uh, we, 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 we took the model and we tried to ad adapt it for, for here. And in the states, they do it outside urban settings. And there's uh, how many? How many trucks? Seven million concentration. Seven million consultation. Yeah, per year. Wow. So when we talk about scaling up, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's definitely a scalable model, but uh, we just need to figure out how we do it first here in Montreal, and after that, go bigger. Uh, just we have a story for when we start mobile clinic, we, we, we call um, Asset the GP uh, to make small wings. Uh, we try to find out um, the phone for the uh, Ministre de la Santé. Oh, the health. Uh, uh, adjoint. Uh, uh, adjoint. Oh, okay, the, the, uh, uh, the assistant to the director of the health. His minister yeah. as well. Yeah. Too. Oh, and he's the he minister is, too? Yeah. <laughs> His contact. We, we find find his contact. We contact him and uh, uh, we uh, we start to present our project. And he he, he said, yeah, uh, I'm in, uh, really interested in your project. If you prove me with cues and in two years that it's scalable and it works in Montreal and we I can give you money after and all uh, government needs to make it on in Quebec and perhaps in Canada. So. <laughs> No, on assistant. How can be assistant? But they might not be. Yeah. In October, they might not be in power anymore. Yeah. What as a setup? But perhaps after, but it will be perhaps that that's another issue for social entrepreneurship that to have a politician agenda. Yes. It's very important. Yes. And we start with this. It's so. It will be easy. It's just private and. Uh, no, I, even you are private, you, you have uh, to keep in your mind uh, so, um, a politician agenda to, in, your, in your business model. Cool, excellent. One last question. I know we're tight on time. We went a bit further. I skipped a few questions. Now, the million dollar question for anybody, uh, how do you measure social impact? <laughs> <laughs> but, but for for us, just for the the Mama clinic, like I said, uh, there's a model already in the states, and we use that model uh, developed by Harvard University, and uh, the different KPIs they did, it's uh, prevention savings, 
So um, by uh, preventing medical complication and not going to the hospital, so with that you can measure the impact uh, fine, uh, with with fine and, uh, with numbers, and also by uh, the number of people not going to the emergency. As we know, the emergencies are really unclogged. So uh, this is another uh, tool, another KPI you can measure. Just, uh, uh, and another one of measure that we are thinking about it for our kids and uh, prove to the government that's our model. That it's good model and good solution. It's uh, in Canada and uh, in our for Montreal we have uh, some schools with anti <coughs> defavorisation. Okay, uh, index uh, under uh, under privilege uh, index. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, areas. And we are, we are our solution is focusing in some some neighborhoods, and we are aiming in two years go there and say if this index is decreasing or not. It could be one of major for us. Okay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> because we work in a network, there's lots of different ways that we measure, but we just take, I can just take one program. So with the universities and college program, um, even though our work is with presidents, VPs, faculty and staff, and not even directly with students, um, our work is to help them better teach social innovation and social entrepreneurship. So we're working indirectly, but we don't measure that impact because nobody cares about that and it's so unsexy. And so we go the, the next to see, um, we say so through our indirect impact, so that's our work on professors that then influences students, we develop 21st century skills. And so that's the teamwork, collaborative problem solving, um, collective entrepreneurship, that kind of stuff. And so so that speaks to um, the, you know, the banks that want to pay for this kind of programs, the provincial funders that um, are, fund, are backing these institutions in the first, these public institutions in the first place. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we land it there because it just, that's what everybody wants to, to hear is how you're adapting to meet um, these students' needs. Then with um, the work that we do with um, the social entrepreneurs, it's because we're looking for social entrepreneurs that are um, addressing systems change, or sorry, let me take that back. Because we're looking for social entrepreneurs that have um, systems changing potential in their innovations, usually we get them before they've hit systems change, right? So I was talking about eco-sanitation. It's like they might have a couple pilots, but they haven't changed the system yet. And so our measure of success for a fellowship program with these high impact social, yeah, so we'll say within, like what's our, our metric is within five years of the, these entrepreneurs becoming um, Ashoka fellows, 50% of them change national policies. So that's an indicator of, of systems change. In our case, the, the KPIs are the product. So, you know, the, the goal is to help beekeepers save X amount of hives, then you know, what we measure is the outcome of that. And on the other side of the growers, um, you know, our, the amount of hives that you save and the performance of the bees that we're taking care of with the beekeepers, how do they affect yield is also part of the product. So that's what we measure as part of our impact. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, our panel. We keep the microphone and we're opening to the floor, uh, who wants has questions? And pass this microphone on. Talk to it because we're being recorded. Let's say hi to the camera. So, are any of you looking to become certified B Corps? And uh, do you believe that the benefit corporation will become a legal entity in Canada soon? Hopefully, uh, what are you doing to help it become a legal entity? Sure. Um, for example, when we on again, like we didn't know or like weren't conscious of the, f of the fact that we were social entrepreneurs when we launched our company, and almost like a year in, so it was still kind of out of our knowledge. So one, when the SVX team approached us, it was one of their. Uh, filter to get companies in is that you have to do the kind of pre-scoring with, with the B Corp. 
Um, and so that helps you really realize on, on different levels what type of impact like you should be working on within the company and you know through your product afterwards. Um, so I think it's a you know it's a good thing to have your B score at least to be conscious of, of the impact that you have. Is it going to become a legal entity in, in Canada? I hope so because um, it legally ties you to your mission, which with normal C Corp or Inks here, you're like you're not linked to. So I think it's a good thing. Um, in our case, you know, promoting SVX and promoting uh, institutions like that that have the power within the government. So like just being on board of that, I think helps. Um, and more than that, eventually becoming a certified B Corp definitely does help for the legal status. I would just say I, I agree with all of that and it's, it's one way to tackle the problem and be very supportive of it. It's not necessarily relevant in our space where we're working as a, as a charity network basically, um, but you know, very, very closely connected to the BCAR core community. If uh, the B Corps might happen, it's going to be in the West, uh, like Alberta or Col uh, Colombia Britannic. Uh, BC uh, before even here. Um, yeah. Hi, so uh, I have two questions. Uh, do you translate the impact you measure into market value? And if that's important, how, how do you do it? And then my second question is how do you see the future of social entrepreneurship in 10 years or 20 years? Do you think there's to be a divide between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship? or? Will it become like a requirement and uh, like social entrepreneurship won't be a thing anymore, just something that must be done? Anyway. What do you intend by market value in terms of translating the impact into like kind of financial, well, my, kind my, of financial uh, KPIs? Or? I feel like one of the main difference between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is how do you measure your impacts? So I feel like like in, in traditional business, it would just be how much money do you generate. So in terms of social entrepreneurship, like, is it interesting to to convert these impacts into money or whatever? And how, how do you sell it? Yeah, I'd say most of the so, like social driven companies that, that, that I know of tend to want to measure what like the impact that they have social wise or environmental wise into some sort of financial impact as well to have some market value or a bit, a bit like you said so i think it comes into play depending who your target audience is as well i think you know like in our case we work with farmers and like you know they're going to buy something if it makes sense financially for, for them so even though like we're helping them save bees like they need to have some financial return on it uh through the product so i think you know most of the time it is but it doesn't have to be and your second question was, uh, in the future, what we believe social entrepreneurship will become, or social, I keep saying entrepreneurship, social uh, projects. Um, I think it needs to become kind of the norm. Uh, and I think that's what you see more, more and more, is like companies that are being born, or nonprofits, or co-ops, or charities that are being born, now tend to have more social driven missions compared to simply making profits or it just exists. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's going to kind of merge at some point. I don't know if it's in five years, ten years, but it needs to happen. Um, yeah. So for the first one, so what I would, what I'm thinking of is a social return on investment. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So you know, um, sometimes that's helpful. We don't have one because it doesn't really make sense for the space that we're in. But we, you know, one of the entrepreneurs that I work with, she does masculinity informed sexual health ed, uh, education, and it's for the ultimate in, uh, impact of preventing domestic violence. So she's seeing domestic violence rates going up in Canada um, and birth rates going down. And so, what she's, her conclusion, I and mean, she also has lots of other evidence, is that um, there's not a lot of, enough focus on young boys and understanding and unpacking masculinity. And so that's our program, but the way that she sells that program is by saying we, she has proxy measures and then she has long-term indicators that show that she can decrease domestic violence rates through this type of program. And so then she calculates the cost, she works in Alberta, of, that the Alberta government spends on, um, you know, um, uh, 
as safe houses for women um, or or men or anybody who, who is in these kinds of situations and all the all the costs associated with that to then come up with it, this number. So there's lots of firms out there that do those kinds of studies. Um, and then for your second question, you know, I I think that um, in ten years there's going to be so much more fluidity between all these different sectors that we created. I think. Uh, I get so frustrated with the divides that people create between private, public, like, oh, like, you are you work for Ashoka, like, that's, like, kind of more on the private uh, social enterprise side, like, we work for the cooperative economy, it's like, we're all, like, yeah. it's, it's just different tools, and they're all useful at different times, and so the more we can accelerate, like, our ability to partner and work in that interstitial space between the sectors, the better, and so, um, that, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm seeing it more, like, you know, we see that a lot in Europe. There's a lot of co-creation between the sectors. Um, and it's, it's here a bit. I'll just go with the second question. Uh, I think right now there's many companies looking into adding uh, into their value chain uh, social entrepreneurs. And it's uh, social entrepreneurs also act as maybe incubators and re research and development for these big companies. And like Danan lately, uh, they did in Bangladesh, uh, they start empowering people there and they were producing uh, yogurt. And so it, for them, for Danan, at one, at one point was a good plan because they have new markets, but also uh, they have a social impact. And so I think like really big companies are getting more aware of uh, being into social things. There's a lot of really great literature on the hybrid value systems, and so you you know that's where you have the demos working with um, Ashoka actually, but um, to to look at how to reach how to address hunger, but also you know demo gets a benefit too. Yeah. So. Do we have other questions, folks? Yes. Yeah, it's for Danica. Do you, does Ashok have activities in third world countries? Yeah, yeah, we're in 90 countries. In 90 countries. Yeah. And, and do you find that in certain third world countries where you have governments who are not very much socially um, um, responsible, do you find this as a big obstacle in helping social entrepreneurs in their, in their countries? Mm -hmm. So the... So that when we first came about, it was specifically for addressing the corruption. So um, that's why, you know, and we say, like, it, it really birthed in India, um, Ashoka. Um, Ashoka's the name of an Indian emperor. Um, but so there were a couple problems there. What the person who started Ashoka, Bill Drayton, saw was that there was corruption not only on the part of the Indian government, but there's also corruption on the part of USAID aid doing, like sending money and beefing up these massive sort of like UN organizations or whatever with, and they're driving around, they're like Mercedes, and like helping other people. It's like there were corruption on many levels. And so it actually, and I'm not, I would never say in a blanket statement that the UN is corrupt. I'm just saying, you know, in that context, this is what, um, what they were trying to, to mitigate. So they're saying, how do we direct resources and funds to, to people, not organizations? And so that's actually how we, we were birthed. Now we're on the other end, 25 years ago, in Canada, where we have a, we have a strong relationship with our government, and our government is actually, uh, you know, they provide a lot of public funding for the work we do. We're now running into trouble because Ashoka says we can't receive money from the government. <laughs> so we're like, but we have a nice government. So, so it's, um, yeah, it actually started that way. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about replicability, uh, not replicating, um, especially in third world countries um, where there may or may not be frameworks or business ideas or even banking financial institutions. So coming up with these incredible ideas and if you want to replicate them, is it necessary for them to 
have similar frameworks of B Corps or running a business this way or creating a financial statements or just focusing on solving the problem for them. What's your perspective on that? Is it necessary to give them the frameworks or no? So just to be clear, is it necessary for other countries to have the same sort of like social infrastructure set up if you're going to adapt a model to them? Social and economic infrastructure, okay. yeah. Um, yes, um, in a sense, well, any solution that you bring into a certain context to a problem that is located in a certain context is probably not re completely replicable in another setting. So I say that because we, like, on our side, like, we're looking to get into now, we've got some sort of traction in North Africa, for example. There's lots of beehives there, but the economical setting and the infrastructure in terms of connectivity there doesn't make it possible for us to be able to ship units in the short term there because they don't have the infrastructure. So the solution that we're applying here is not necessarily replicable uh, in very specific context if we just take it from what it is now to just copy past it there. That being said, you know, maybe there's ways to adapt it. Um, so I'd say you're going to get tons of responses, like different responses to your question because it really depends on the context and the problem and the solution. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say that you will most likely, uh, the answer will be no almost 100% of the time. So what's important is that you look at what's, what's the DNA that makes up this new idea or this, this model and then what are the essential pieces? So, you know, it might be, I need to have a partner that's willing to pay for the salaries of the employees in my, um, in my street side social enterprise. In Quebec, it's Envoi Quebec, mm -hmm. and it's the, the restaurants. But if I go to um, Paris, they might not have an Envoi Quebec. So who, who is benefiting from having men and women who are struggling with homelessness um, now like emerging out of homelessness and so you find those partners so it's more like understanding like what are the ingredients that make the cake <laughs> or the you know whatever I don't know why I said cake um, but and, and then figuring out how you're gonna match that when you adapt it Nathan? Um, in my opinion, I, uh, not engaged in the Mamobi clinic in this way, but um, uh, perhaps not replicable, but sharing our practices, good practices in these worlds, it's, uh, in these uh, countries, yeah, it's something that we, it could be a good idea and we have to, uh, perhaps to do it, but um, we have to adapt it for culture, for context, for all of, for, for of these countries. Uh, and one of issue that uh, if we are Canada or like my country from France to give like uh, take framework of solution that works in France and works in perhaps in Morocco or in Algeria or Senegal like it works in France it's not a good idea because it's, it's why uh, it's something that's why taking our power of good countries and give us this good idea you have to do it but the best practices is share good practices and start it with people, with countries, and develop it in our, their, their countries as they could do it. Do we have uh, any other questions? Yes, right here. Hi, um, thank you for sharing all your experiences. I was just wondering that there's a lot of literature on, um, say, cross-sector partnerships, hybrid organizations. And you've all spoken about systems change and now there's this shift in view that you're moving from the idea of heroic entrepreneurs to um, with one more humility that we're system builders. You all mentioned co-creation. So could you talk about how does this process of collaborative efforts for co-creating solution actually unfolds? What does it involve? For example, sharing knowledge, resources, developing capabilities. So, so if when I think of the entrepreneurs in our network, typically what's how it works is that they'll come up with a great idea, like either of these two um, initiatives. 
they'll, there'll be a lot of control at the outset to refine and, and test and, and prototype that idea, right? Like you might not have a lot of partners at the outset, but like in, in three years, you're working and churning and you're, most of it is under your organizational umbrella. So usually it takes some time to develop a model or, or whatever it is and, and demonstrate the, the sort of proof of concept or the promising idea. And then from there, that's when the co-creation typically happens. Of course, you can have co-creation at the outset, but I, I find that that then becomes a 15-year process rather than a three-year process internally and then a two-year process of partnership building. Do you know what I mean? Because if you have too many hands in the pie at an early stage, it can be very beneficial for some types of outcomes, but it, it can really slow things down. So if you just get a small team that really understands the problem at the beginning, then you can pull in other people. So um, what does that actually look like? So for Ashoka, we have this universities and college program. It helps to make colleges and universities more innovative, entrepreneurial, and socially impactful. Um, we developed that model over a 10-year process. Um, and now, today, for instance, I was talking to Colleges and Institutes Canada, it's the federation that represents all colleges and institutes across the country, and we're now working with them to co-create a training. So rather than Ashoka delivering the training as like a hub and spoke model, it's like we have 50 colleges that we've worked with individually. Now we pull in um, CICAN, Colleges and Institutes Canada, we train them on how to do this type of work, and then they go out to their network of 150 colleges in Canada and roll it out. So that's where we sort of like step away from the control of the idea, bring them in. They also bring, it's not like we're training them good for us. It's like we actually don't know this sector as well as they do. And so they help us to improve our model and meet the needs of that sector better. I don't really have much more to say than that. Cool. Well. Uh, we're pretty much done, folks. Uh, if uh, some people have want to talk one on one, I don't know if our uh, guests are willing to stay a bit longer. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists and a big round of applause to uh, Dedica Strait of Africa, Jean Philippe Couture, and uh, Nathan Gabi <laughs> of uh, Mabobi Clinic, and also a big thank to Martin Le Lagarde of uh, Nectar. A big round of applause. Thank you very much. for coming. So for those of you that don't know about District 3 and you're looking to build a social um, social entrepreneurship business, so to speak, um, you can speak to Julie. Uh, she's going to be here as well. But we do have uh, different programs and different services that we offer to our entrepreneurs. Um, so <coughs> please make sure to check that out. If you go on our website, there's two pages, Launch and Grow. So if you, already, if you just have an idea and you want to make sure that this is something that you want to pursue further, we we do have a process that we take you through so that you're able to validate that and make sure that it's something that's viable, whether it's going to be non-profit, co-op, or for-profit, it doesn't matter. It's for you to be able to talk to potential customers. So make sure to check that out. We Our deadline for applications is August 18th, and so we're going to be sending you an email shortly after this event and with a survey as well to get your feedback. But if you have any questions, make sure to come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.